Uh, some of you know I don't need a microphone. Uh, welcome to the Bethel Historical Society's 2016 Women's History Month program. Uh, I'm Randy Bennett. I'm the executive director of the Bethel Historical Society, and it's a pleasure to see so many of you here today. I'm very glad uh, we've got a large group. There's no penalty for arriving late. Uh, and I never put anyone on the spot either. Uh, for this annual event, we are especially pleased to be partnering, partnering this year, which is our 50th anniversary. We were founded. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Fifty years ago, we were founded as a small town historical society upstairs in the Bethel Library. When I came to the society, we had three boxes of artifacts, three cardboard boxes. We're up over 40,000 artifacts now, and our new librarian archivist is standing, Will Chapman, is standing at the uh, camera, uh, and he is facing... Uh, years and years of work known as, uh, let's see, that's uh, known as, as uh, what's the term for it? Cataloging. Well, it's cataloging, but that's security. Yeah. He, has, uh, he has job security. Uh, this year we're partnering with the Ski Museum of Maine uh, as they launch what will likely be a regular and important series of similar programs celebrating and documenting the significant but under-recognized uh, contributions of women uh, to Maine ski history. For their work in connection with this event, I'd like to especially thank uh, Wendy Gray, president of the Ski Museum of Maine. And also Scott Andrews, who is the Ski Museum's curator and research director. Scott will be presenting the first uh, showing of this new program about women in Maine ski history. Uh, from our own organization, I want to thank Dan and Nickerson, who couldn't be here today, uh, our administrative assistant, Will Chapman. Uh, whose grandmother, by the way, worked here at the Bethel Inn for many, many years and has an entire wing named for her. Um, and Jackie Bell, Jackie's here somewhere for uh, out here at the registration table for their valuable assistance. As many of you know, the Ski Museum of Maine, currently based in Kingfield, hopes to open a satellite museum here in Bethel in the very near future. Yeah. With this in mind, I'm pleased to announce that thanks to another collaboration between the Ski Museum and the Bethel Historical Society, the New England Ski Museum at Cannon Mountain in Franconia Notch has agreed to loan its current exhibit, The Mountains of Maine Skiing in the Pine Tree State, to the Bethel Historical Society, this spring, and the display will open up at our Robinson House, which is diagonally across the common from the Bethel Inn on June 24th, and will run through the winter of 2016-2017. So I hope you'll all come back and have a chance to see that. The Ski Museum will also be loaning a number of very interesting artifacts to go along uh, with that exhibit. Uh, so now, without further ado, to introduce today's speaker and program, please welcome uh, the president of the Ski Museum of Maine, Wendy Gray. Thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate this. Uh, I guess I don't need one either. But, uh, and I especially appreciate all the gentlemen that are in the room today. <laughs> Concerned, but you know, JB, Brian, Steve, Scott, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors, and appropriately, our sponsors are all women owned businesses in Bethel. So, thanks to Ann Carter, Carter's Cross Country Ski Center. Amy Halstead from the Halstead Agency. <laughs> and I want to thank Mahusik Realty, Cindy Kayla Hebert, yeah. Rebecca Lee. 
Erica Mulley, Joyce Pereira, Ronnie Hansen, Deb Martin, and Amanda Diulio. I'm not sure if anybody's here today. Main Street Realty, Fran Head, who's our local state representative. And Cindy Moxie. From Mountain Real Estate, Susan DuPlessis. In the Bethel Village Motel, Ruth Grover. <laughs> the Brokers at Sunday River Reilly, uh, Real Estate, Sherry Thurston, Margie Finley, and Julia Young. <laughs> and I want to give special thanks to Carol DuPlessis from Pooh Corner Farm and Greenhouses, Lori Harris, and Graphics who is the publisher of Bethel Living Magazine. There are some copies like that. Um, and Connie St. Pierre from Tourmaline Media. And Connie is the designer of our poster. At this time, I'd like to introduce Scott Andrews. Scott and I work together um, I'm his Vanna White, usually. <laughs> um, Scott's from Portland. Um, he's the, uh, the research director and also the Snow Trail editor. Snow Trail is our newsletter, and there are copies of our newsletter on the registration table. Um, please pick one up uh, as you leave. There's a lot of interesting information in there, and basically um, all the information about what you're going to actually see today. Um, Scott is uh, no slouch. He's a has a BA and an MBA from the University of Chicago, and did graduate work at the London School of Economics. Um, and believe it or not, Mick Jagger is actually older than he is. Um, he's a PSIA certified ski instructor. Um, he's a registered Maine guide, and he's a ski writer and photographer, ski blogger and um, he writes and contributes to Cross Country Skier Magazine and Ski Area Management. Um, and it, the other interesting thing I think about Scott is that, yes, he writes about skiing, but how he puts food on the table is that he is a cultural journalist reviewing high opera. So he goes from the sublime, reviewing the opera, to the ridiculous in interviewing extreme skiers like Simon and Mike. <laughs> so with that, take it away, Scott. <laughs> Thank you very much, Wendy. Um, Wendy, when I when I told Wendy that I was a graduate of the London School of Economics and that uh, Mick Jagger also went there, she's never managed to get get over that. <laughs> I, I do want to point out that I have a degree from the London School. Mick, Mick Jagger is a dropout. <laughs> He, um, he, had, he, he, had, he has succeeded quite well in life. And I also recently learned that uh, Monica Lewinsky is another, also a graduate. Nick was, Nick was a little before my time, and Monica's after my time. So I'm, um, I'm the curator and research director of the... Um, Ski Museum of Maine, and, and my happy lot in life is to go around the state doing a couple of things. One is I talk to people, I talk, visit historical societies and museums, and I collect information on the history of skiing in Maine. And then I also write about it in our Snow Trail journal, and I go around the state giving talks on ski history. And I've given these talks from Madawaska to Kittery, from the Hampshire State Line to the New Brunswick International Boundary. So as you can see from my, the uh, credits here, I'm, I'm a hot shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I want to uh, give a shout out to Randy 
Bennett and the Bethel Historical Society. Not only are they hosting us, but these, this idea came from them originally. They wanted to fill an important slot in their schedule of events and, and asked Ed Wendy Gray whether or not it could be done. And Wendy in turn called me and I said, I'll give you an hour, <coughs> call you back in an hour and tell you if it can be done. And I quickly went through my collection of slides and so on, and I said, yeah, this is a great subject, and we can, we can really go to town on it. I also, of course, want to give a shout out to the uh, Bethel Inn for hosting us. I, I give quite a few of these talks here at the Bethel Inn. Finally, before we really get in, I want to, I want to emphasize that this is definitely a work in progress. Yeah, this is the construction that John will look at. That it's part of the ongoing effort to improve the quality of the knowledge, the quality of the shows, the quality of the publications of the Ski Museum, that we're always looking for photographs or mementos or people to share memories. And we're going to get some of that after, after I finish and we have a little break. We're going to have a panel discussion with uh, some people who are really into the movers and the shakers uh, today and in the past in, in Main Ski history. Six, uh, six women have really made a mark in, in our state. So one of the first things that, that I had to confront when dealing with a subject is, well, what is the difference between men and women in the history of, of skiing in Maine? Well, there are some differences in their experiences and there are a lot of similarities. So we're going to go back and, and start with how did skiing come to me? And we wanted to, we're going to deal with this subject in, well, we're going to deal with the whole subject in four sections. One is women who have made a contribution to skiing in Maine, mostly through the sort of things that an ordinary housewife would do, an ordinary non-skiing woman might do. Then we're going to go on to people, skiers, women skiers, who made the same sort of difference, but they were definitely on skis and inactive. Then we're going to go into a section I call fast flying females. Those are the athletes, and we have a number of them here on hand tonight. And finally, I'm going to go to the section called making an impact, or today's movers and shakers. So how did, how did skiing get to me? Well, it began in the period right after the Civil War. The rural population was being depleted. People were moving into the cities to take jobs in factories. They were moving out west where the soil was fertile and there were fewer rocks and fewer trees to, fewer weeds. <laughs> Governor Joshua Chamberlain decided he wanted to do a rural re-energizing process. And he wanted to do it by going to Europe and finding some immigrants who would be well suited to Maine. And he sent an emissary to, the, to Sweden in 1870 and recruited uh, the first of about 3,000 Swedes who eventually came over. The first, first group the first group came over in 1870 there were 51 of them, and they um, settled in the northern part of the state, the area known as the Swedish Colony. Today's towns, New Sweden, Stockholm, West Berlin. Of those 51 Swedes, we had 11 single men, 11 couples, which of course meant 11 uh, adult women, and 18 kids, and we don't know the breakdown of the, of the kids. The um, Couples were hardy farm folks. They were also the first skiers in, in New England. Um, there, were, there were three waves, or three groups. There were Swedes to begin with. Locally, the Finns came in the 1890s. And this is a Finnish couple from West Paris, sometime around the turn of the century. We didn't have roads. Most of the uh, immigrants didn't have enough money to buy a horse and sleigh or anything like this. When they wanted to get around in the snow, 
the use of these. What year do you think this is? Um, oh, 31, thank you. Well, uh, this particular shot was taken in 1922. And this uh, this next one was 1931, and this this was taken decades after the first waves of immigrants came. But kids went to school in Arista County on skis well into the 1930s. Yeah, her name is Eleanor. It's my chum and I, is what it says. We also had a a group. Um, recreational skiers forming around 1895, the first ski club mentioned that we know of that we made. It's called the Caribou Ski Club. And um, for a couple of years, every time they met, the social column of the newspaper would carry a report of what they were doing. And apparently, Mrs. R.L. Towns Oyster Stew was the, was the big hit of the Saturday Night Gathering. <laughs> and I... <laughs> and I, I make this point because pretty clearly Mrs. R. L. Towns was an important figure in developing skiing. She didn't do it because she was a great athlete or a great administrator, she didn't run a ski area, but she was part of that social glue that helped keep the Caribou Ski Club together. And we get, this is the first section of the story, kind of looks at people, women who are doing things similar to that. Around the turn of the century, skiing morphed from a purely transportation mode to a sport. And we see women appearing almost as soon as, as, soon as it turns into a sport. This, this is the illustration that is used for the cover of the first book on skiing published in America. It was called The Winter Sport of Skiing. It was written by Theo A. Johnson. But the image conveyed here is pretty clear. Skiing is something that's fun, and it's something you do with your, a guy, like, going to do with his wife or his girlfriend. Maybe it's, it's courting. But women were clearly part of the picture from the beginning. <coughs> also in the picture, this is an interior photo from that same book. <laughs> If it looks a little funny, it, it is. The uh, figures and the costumes are, this, it's a real photograph. They are photographed in, indoors in a studio in Portland. And the, and the backdrop, the backdrop has been painted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. great. <laughs> School children in Portland were among the first to participate in the new sport. Got a couple of pictures of girls from the, what we think is the Roosevelt School, which is on uh, Stevens Avenue in, in Portland. The winter carnivals were the way a lot of people got involved in, in skiing. And this first section, I'm going to sort of look at some of the beauty queens. But there's usually a story behind that. These are not the most beautiful girls in the world. Uh, this is from the program book Rumford. It turns out that the queen of the carnival in Rumford was not based on a beauty contest or a popularity co contest. It was based on how many tickets you sold to the winter carnival. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I like it. It's, 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 it, it, it rewards people with a lot of gumption and get up and go and the willingness to knock on doors when you buy a, a ticket for the Winter Carnival or when you buy an ad for the program. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> this was uh, the Queen of the Winter Carnival in Augusta in, I believe, 1924. A lot of times, some of the big cities, the queens were um, wives or daughters of prominent businessmen or politicians. This is Catherine Wyman. She's the daughter of the founder of uh, Central Maine Power Company. And, and she was an uh, important business, and her, her dad was an important business ally of uh, William Howard Gannett, who was the organizer of the, of the uh, carnival. 
<laughs> this uh, photograph was taken in the Winter Carnival of Portland in 1924. <laughs> and now, we're, we're moving up to some of the colleges in the 1920s and the 1930s. The colleges were hugely important in getting uh, people in general involved in skiing, and particularly women. In this case, the woman is a skier. Most of the queens that got cold were skiers. She's uh, uh, pictured in a triumphal arch. Her, uh, her uh, runners up, the runners up for the, for the carnival queen, are holding the, the poles along. This is another carnival queen at, at Colby, and she was a skier. The the fashion of of women at the colleges was not lost on the Fatima Cigarette Company. Oh. The Fatima, Fatima Cigarette was a uh, premium brand of cigarettes, and these are the ads that they were placing in the college newspapers. Uh, this is the 1920s. These women probably uh, danced the Charleston. They wore flapper dresses at night. They had a bootleg gin strapped and under the dress, and they smoked Fatima cigarettes. And, and yes, they did ski and, uh, at the time of the winter carnivals. <laughs> Porches Mitchell and Braun was the big retail company in Portland, and they, again, were selling fashions to skiing women in the 1930s. You could buy a set of snow training tugs for about $20. And they add up all the components <coughs> on the page. Uh, for perspective's sake, uh, a, a secretary in a downtown Portland office at that time made about $20 a week, so she could, she could pull the whole thing on, on one week's pay on, on a set of snow train tugs. The uh, skis would probably cost her about uh, $10 with, with everything, and she would buy a ticket on the snow train for a dollar. This is, uh, I'm going to skip ahead about 30 years. This is Barbara Jenny, who was the uh, wife of Hans Jenny, mm -hmm. yeah, who ran the Pleasant Mountain Ski School. Mm -hmm. And um, I interviewed Barbara a few years ago, and the first thing you hear from Barbara is, you don't want to talk to me. I was the background music to Hans. And I heard that, that phrase which she repeated many times, ah. background music was part of the title of the section. But when you look at it a little bit further, she was a lot more than background music. She ran, the, she co-ran the ski school. She was a um, certified instructor. She did the marketing, the books. She ran the, the <coughs> ski shop. Picture of her, probably 63 or so. And speaking of uh, ski shops, uh, a number of women ran the ski shops while their husband ran a, a more high-profile operation. This particular case on the right is Shirley Letarte. Her, her uh, husband ran the ski slope at Deer Hill on Main Street in Westbrook, and he also had a ski shop on um, downtown Westbrook. And Shirley ran the uh, shop, and her daughter is, uh, they're posing for a some sort of a publicity picture here. Connie Thurston was an important contributor to skiing, the growth of skiing here in Bethel, primarily through the Vernon Street rope tow, and then later, of course, Sunday River. She tends to be overshadowed by the yeah. reputation and achievements of her husband, Mike, but uh, she was a very important part. And I remember <coughs> some years ago, <coughs> an event here sponsored by Randy and the Historical Society. And one of her jobs on the coldest nights of the year when Sunday River was brand new and had a very unreliable furnace was that people had to take turns sitting all night in the base lodge because in case the furnace went out, the pipes would freeze and 
season might be over. So somebody had to stay in the baseline all night long, and if the furnace broke, call the furnace guy to come over and fix it. And she was she was one of those who stayed up all night to to mind the furnace. Uh, this lady is uh, Jane Luthy. Uh, she's identified uh, mostly with Mount Abram. I think she's pretty typical of the skiing wife of the 1950s, 1960s. She gets selected for a presentation here because her husband was a wonderful photographer, and her son and her son saved all the pictures and shared them with us. <laughs> So this, this is Jane Luthley, probably about 1950. This is uh, probably 15 years later, up at Sugarloaf. It's actually his mother had that hat. And the, the, the skiing homemaker, uh, the Luthies, um, Mar H. Merrill Luthie, her husband, Jane Luthie, built the first uh, ski lodge at uh, Mount Abram. This is the first. Uh, a frame in the A frame village down there. It's still uh, her son, who's on the left, Rick uh still occupies it every single weekend. And he's, he's been an uh, instructor at uh, at uh, Mount Abram for 30 years or something like that. <coughs> Apple pie. Um, Ma Judson was one of the pioneers of the the. Um, lifestyle at Sugarloaf. She and her husband started the first motel in Carabasset Valley and they were home away from home for weekends for you know a generation of skiers. She was particularly noted for her apple pie and uh, John, John Christie, the former president of the ski museum, always makes a point of reminding me, tell them that she bought the apples from my orchard. <laughs> We've just had some batteries fall out of this thing. Who's, oh, okay. who's in charge? <laughs> uh, this, this picture was taken uh, Fairly late in life, but uh, uh, she represents the apple pie of the oyster stew, apple, apple pie, and background music. A non skier, uh, Muriel Arsenault on the right here. Uh, she was on skis once in her life. Hated it. But, 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 her, but, her, but her husband was one of the mainstays of the. Uh, Chisholm Ski Club in Romford, and she, her, her specialty was hospitality, especially the race, the many races that uh, Chisholm hosted. In fact, the, the building that was used as the feed station for the racers and the volunteers is called Muriel's Kitchen. Uh, still, still up there. Got a, got a great sign. This is, this is Muriel's Kitchen. Uh, another case of uh, women who are making a difference by hosting races, doing you know, ordinary things like washing bibs. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I, I, lo I love this picture because it, it, there's, a, there's a back story to it, too. I look at it and you say, okay, this is the typical three grandmothers are in the kitchen, they're making the hors d'oeuvres for a fundraising function for the Sugarloaf Mountain Ski Club. The uh, lady in the front's name is Ginny Bowsom. She has also been a certified instructor at Sugarloaf for at least 30 years. And she also serves as the chairman of the Education Foundation of the Sugarloaf Mountain Ski Club. So. There's, there's a lot. I, you know, I say background. It's like like uh, Barbara Jenny. She's rather self-effacing. This is sort of the public persona, but she's really a great skier. And, and 
illustrates why some of the um, um, so, so many women have so many multiple roles in life, and especially in, in, in skiing and business relationships. This next section parallels the first section, except we're going to talk more about people who actually got on skis. Um, at the turn of the century, the Poland Spring property was the first large winter sports resort in Maine. They undertook advertising programs and they brought people up for weekends, mostly overnight on trains. And this is just an example of, of some people trying out skiing. Some of them, of course, are trying out uh, uh, kick sleds. But yeah, look, look at the length of the skis. <laughs> this picture is probably this picture is prob probably. <laughs> Probably about 1920. <coughs> it might be earlier. It could be, it could be 1910. Um, what's obviously a lesson. We've got five people here, three of them are women. And uh, for those of you who can remember the old Poland Spring House, the, the great yellow building with the domes and the turrets, that's it in the background. Also notice that they all had one polar. <coughs> that was common at that time. In a, in the, at the Roosevelt School in Portland, skiing was uh, one of the kids' activities. The picture was probably taken around 1920. The Deering High School Ski Club was a major factor in Portland in the 1930s. It was um, basically recreational skiers, mostly a, a handful of, of racers, but mostly people who just wanted to learn how to ski. The faculty organizer was uh, Ted Johnson here. They built a cabin. They, they bought some land and bought um, built a cabin, used it as an overnight. It was at, um, up in Baldwin. It was about you know 30 mile, 35 miles from Portland. The uh, cabin only had one room, and so for the overnight trips, they uh, alternated between boys and girls. This was a girls' weekend. This would be the chaperone. Ted would have his own car. He would drive back to, to Portland. Boy. <laughs> 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 the this, is, this is one of the. One of the girls that weekend coming down Douglas Mountain. And so, 1930. When did they start using two poles? Oh, some some people started using two poles in, in 1900. It, it was use of two poles wasn't really universal until the, the 30s. Okay. Uh, up up until the 30s, mm -hmm. some people still use, especially the old-fashioned people right. in Aroostook County, right. uh, use one pole. Yeah. Again, we're, go we're going to Colby College, some of the vintage pictures of women in, in the winter carnivals. It's obviously a, a publicity photo because the photographer very carefully arranged the, uh, um, the tower of the, of the building. Another one of the carnival pieces. <laughs> Colby, Colby, Bowden, Humane, and Bates all had all had uh, winter cabins for their outing clubs. And this is a scene from the interior of the winter of the cabin for the Colby College. Clearly, a very social scene. <laughs> Skipping to Pleasant Mountain in the 1950s, we have a couple of members of the Downey Ski Club. The Downey Ski Club was founded around 1947. It was an outgrowth of a um, social group founded by the uh, YMCA in Portland. And it became so popular that they split off. And in the immediate post-war years, it was uh, 
very much a dating scene. By the 1950s, it was very much a family scene. And by the 1960s, it uh, was a family scene with, with teenagers and, and so on. One of the one of the great advantages of uh, the social scene was, you know, you could hope to ride up the lift with a handsome ski instructor. <laughs> or a beautiful woman. Or, and, uh, <laughs> the uh, lady's name is Dottie Moran. We don't know who the instructor. We do, we do know it's an instructor, but we don't know his name. It's a pleasant mountain in the 50s. This seems to be a sort of a joke photo. The um, two ladies are, are reading a brochure. If you got up close, it'll say, learn to ski. <laughs> I, 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 I think it was, it was a joke. The, um, some, of the, some of the pictures in this series were very clearly taken by a photographer with a sense of humor and imagination. One of them was, was this one. This is, this is Barbara Jenny on the right and her husband Hans on the left. Um, they are. They took a, they took a photograph of the two and then cut it out and then pasted it over a huge enlargement of a, of a ski hole. <laughs> This is the This is the latest. This is the latest in in ski boots. This is the hankies. The first, the first metal buckle. It was a. My dad. It was a metal buckle, but a leather boot. And as I said, Hans and Barbara ran the ski school together. Barbara was a much bigger factor than I think she's given credit for. One of her innovations was the, the, the women's program. <laughs> Throw down your dust mops, kick the ironing into the closet, and slam that door. This is for you. Get away from it all and come ski with us. Every Tuesday morning at 10.30, we have special ski classes just for you. Well, you know, if you want to get real profound psychologically, um, Sigmund Freud had a very, very, very famous um, comment that he made to a French psychiatrist, a woman, French, French woman psychiatrist. He says, what is it that women want? And about 40 years later, Cindy Lauper came back and said, girls just want to have fun. And this is, this is Barbara Jenny playing the Cindy Lauper role. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> this, this was an advertisement that ran the Bridgeton News. And there, there, we have a bunch of other ones. Right? We give, that on if we give too. birth to men, they need to remember it. And Barbara Jenny was you know, right in tune with the times. Uh, <laughs> Housewife, women's program, classes. This is a way up in Arista County. This is a five-hour drive. <coughs> Hausfrau, of course, is a German for housewife. They were, they were running a little place, little rope tow hill on Holt called uh, Hubby Hill. Oh. Unfortunately, the, uh, the photograph is out of focus, but the, uh, the, uh, it's the inscription that really is valuable here. <coughs> So, move, moving ahead to the present, to women who are, are very much on snow and involved. This is a mother-daughter team, um, uh, Katie Keogh and Barbara, Barbara, you know what her mom's 
Terry? That, Terry. that doesn't look like Katie, but Terry? Ter Terry Keogh, is that her? I, yeah, but somehow that doesn't look like Katie to me. It's the, it's the photograph that Katie sent me. Okay, that's oh. Katie and Terry. <laughs> <laughs> that it's Katie and Terry. <laughs> and they did the Maine Mountain series, right? Yeah, they, uh, the, the mom ran the Maine Mountain series for quite a few years, and Katie is, a, is an aspiring athlete who I believe is living in Steamboat Springs right now and competing with the uh, Steamboat Springs uh, Athletic Club. Cool. Just a coach for us. Uh, this is um, Maine Handicap Skiing, mm -hmm. nowadays known as Maine Adaptive. This is uh, uh, Judy um, Sullivan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's Lori Finch. Lori has a complete set of season passes for Mount Abram, starting in 1962. Wow, really? When she was a little girl. And, she, and she's, she's been teaching at the ski school for forever. She's also running the women's programs at, uh, at uh, Mount Abram. And I don't think they currently have one, but she's done it in the past. This is May Audebert, who's been on the ski patrol at Mount um, at Lost Valley for 38 years. June Geiger, who uh, she is um, she is, next year she celebrates her 50th year in the ski business. I believe that about 24 of those years were on ski patrol, and she is now running the race department at Shawnee Peak. This picture was taken inside the race track. She, she announces the times as, as they come up on the computer screen. And um, some of my own some of my own favorite ladies. Uh, this is the skiing quartet for the Maine Outdoor Adventure Club. Um, they are sort of the backbone of the club's social ski group. They go on every Sunday to a different different mountain. <coughs> And I, I, I join them quite often. And uh, we have a, um, there's, another, there's another lady in the club who, um, known popularly as Rapunzel, <laughs> who I wanted to take a picture of, but I think she was in the hospital that day. Funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, so let's take a look at some of the some of the athletes. The story of and this is this is where women's ski history departs from the male history. There's a definite branching. Starts in the 1920s, the 1930s, and doesn't really start coming back together until the the, the present time. Historically speaking, that's about the last 20, 30 years. This was um, this is the first women's competition in, in Maine. It was schoolgirl races at the Winter Carnivals. These girls are lined up for the ski dash. The uh, a lot of the competitions were run over very short distances. They were basically track events with with people on skis instead of running shoes. You know, the 100 yard dash, the 440. Mm -hmm. This is um, almost certainly the, the, the school group from the um, Roosevelt School on Roosevelt School. Or for the women, the competition in the 20s and the 30s was sporadic. Uh, they competed at the local and school carnivals in the 20s and the 30s, but they didn't compete at the higher levels. Mm -hmm. The, the men at that time, the schools started forming teams, and they would travel outside to Augusta, especially Rumford. Rumford was the biggest competition in those days. And all the colleges had a men's team that, that went to the Rumford Carnival and competed. But the girls would stay home, and they would compete intramural in their own school carnivals, but not outside the school. That began to change. But the change was pretty slow. It started in the 1930s. The Schism Ski Club was one of the first to really have an organized 
program that involved women, and one of the athletes who's here on the panel tonight uh, uh, was a member of that group, and I'm hoping she'll talk a little bit about it. It was news when women were competing at, at the collegiate level, and this is an advertisement, uh, an, an article from the Lewiston Daily Sun of 1940, and it's announcing that Miss Louise Thibodeau will be the featured um, contestant from the Rumford Chisholm Ski Club, hmm. and mentions a couple of others. Yeah. But it makes it pretty clear from the context of the article, this is a brand new thing. And uh, this is one of the classic photos of, of the Rumford Chisholm age. Leslie Miller on the right, and uh, Liz Chenard on the left. In the heyday of the Chisholm Ski Club, 37 kids went to Junior Olympics. Uh, 30, 32 of them were boys, 5 of them were girls, and Liz and, and Leslie were two of the girls. Another, another woman who was notable for her achievements in athletic competition was uh, Jean Luce. Not so much for her speed, but for her organizing abilities. This is a picture of Jean and Sugarloaf General Manager Harry Baxter. It's a, it's a posed picture there. They're promoting the 1971 World Cup at Sugarloaf. And um, that that event had a had a some, somewhat unexpected and very fortunate byproduct. This was a World Cup level race, and there were two kids on the Sugarloaf Mountain Ski Club team who got a big opportunity to advance. It turned out that because Sugarloaf was hosting the event they got a couple of extra start spots in this uh, class of, you know, a roster of world-class athletes. And Gail Blackburn was one of those who uh, got a start spot on the race, did well enough, she attracted the attention of the U.S. coaches, she was invited to a, a camp, and eventually made the U.S. Uh, ski team. That's, a, that's Gail right there. The, the particular photograph was taken by somebody who was writing an article about ski fashions. I mean, if, if, it, if, it, looks, if it looks odd to you, that's why. And this is the uh, page from the Main Ski Hall of Fame induction program booklet covering Gale. <laughs> Another freestyle, yeah. That that's where we, where we, the, the women were really starting to make an impact here. This is Karen Coburn from Bangor, and she skied out of Squaw Mountain. She's shown here competing in ballet. This next uh, it's Karen Karen again in moguls. Karen won the first. U.S. National Freestyle Championship held at Killington in 1975. Uh, she joined a, a, a pro tour. <coughs> she turned pro right after this, and uh, unfortunately for her career, at, right after turning pro, the, or a couple of years after turning pro, the, the tour folded. But she had a pretty glorious run for a couple of years. Somebody who really had a glorious run was uh, Joni McWilliams in Sugarloaf. Uh, Joni was the successor to Karen. She won the U.S. National Championship in 1976 and won it for the next four years straight. She was the dominant free U.S. freestyle skier in the country from 76 until 1983 when she had an accident that pretty much ended her competitive career, but she still, she still uh, coaches at Sugarloaf. I believe she's the athletic director. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is uh, Lily Morrison, who uh, is in the Canadian Ski Hall of Fame, but she um, she grew up in Naples, Maine, and you know, competed for the uh, Bruce Cole's uh, freestyle 
group back at Pleasant Mountain in the 1960s. Which is obviously, in, this looks like a rather awkward moment in ballet. <laughs> Ah, girl. Local, local girl, um, great story, someday she'll tell it, um, how she got into, into skiing, it was, was an interesting story, I just don't have time to tell it, but um, she's from South Paris, this is Leslie Bancroft, she um, became in rapid success, succession main state champion, U.S. champion, Olympian. She went to the 1980 Olympics in Lake Placid and then came back in 88 at um, Calgary. And uh, she has a house here in Bethel, and she's a frequent um, skier. I've, I've met her on the trails at uh, Sunday River several times in the last few years. Oh, Julie Parisian. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Probably the most successful woman, uh, alpine skier. This is a, a Rossignol poster. <laughs> Julie, Julie went to three Olympics, uh, and she won three World Cup races. She was also a dominating figure on the uh, Pro Tour. This is Sarah Billmeyer out of Yarmouth. Uh, she was a disabled skier who dominated the, the downhill racing in the 1990s. She's a member of the Main Ski Hall of Fame. <laughs> this is uh, Nikki P in the lead here is Nikki Pilavakis, who's here tonight. She is winning the uh, international, the world's first uh, snowboard, snowboard cross competition held in Switzerland. And Nikki, Nikki's got a great story, and I hope she'll tell it to me. Uh, Kirsten Clark, dominant racer, alpine racer of the 1990s, early 2000s. Uh, Luba Lowry from uh, Maine Adaptive Sports and Recreation. She's on a sit ski. Another pair of ladies who have made their mark internationally in paralyzed or Paralympic skiing is the Lindsay Ball on the left and her guide Diane Barris. Uh, they're shown at a ski resort yeah. on the left and shown yeah. visiting the White House yeah. on the right. She skied the mountain and so she has her Lindsay is almost totally blind. And she skis with, by following Diane. Diane has a loudspeaker that is strapped to, as a, to a backpack. And she goes down through the gates and, and describes the, the line that, that Lindsay needs to take. Wow. <laughs> and I said that we were going to keep this uh, the story up to date. This is from yesterday's Press Herald. Uh, a woman from Cape Elizabeth has won the U.S. Championship uh, Biathlon Sprints. Yeah. And um, a, a hopeful in the in the snowboarding world, another another picture of uh, Katie and Terry Keo. Barbara's nodding her head. Yeah. That looks like I said they both they both came from. I know. I know. So the final. Uh, yeah. There's one other, sort of a digression. We're not talking about here, we're not talking about Maine women. We are hosting a world event. Um, some, of, some of you may have remembered that the inclusion of women in the Olympic ski jumping was a matter of major controversy for, for some time. And, and the women jumped at Sochi. They had one event, Normal Hill, uh, single event at Sochi. 
But as early as the 1990s, they were trying to, you know, they were knocking at the door trying to get in. And one of the first times that an international open women only competition under international rules was held was in Rumford, 1996. And that's the official logo of the, of the event. Women, women had, a, had a, a history of occasionally jumping. Uh, this one was in 1924 at the Portland Winter Carnival. And uh, it's um, Margaret Town, who was from the uh, Norwegian Ski Club of Berlin, New Hampshire. She, she, the whole team sent a delegation to jump in the uh, 1924 carnival, and, and she was one of them. She attracted, being the only woman, uh, she, was, she attracted quite a bit of attention. But by and large, ski jumping was for the guys. Women would participate in cross country, downhill slalom, but jumping was, was men only. <laughs> there was a notable exception, Diane Fournier at, um, at the Chisholm Ski Club was yep. jumping in the 1970s, and that's a contemporary picture of her. She's been a, a track coach at uh, Mount Ararat and Thompson for, for decades. One of, one of my projects for this coming year is to sit her down and, and, and talk about her, her days. This is from the 1996 event. The, um, it, was, it was called the International Women's Championships, but in fact it was really mostly teenage girls. The uh, average age was about 13, and, and some of the competitors were 11 and 12. This was, this was the oldest. Her name was Ava Ganster. She was from Austria, and she was far and away the best. The organizer from the U.S. point of view was uh, Danny, Danny Warner, pictured right here, and this is, this is Ava's coach, I don't know his name, and, and this, is, this is Ava heading up the scaffold for her job. This is, this is, this is Ava in action. This, this, is the photo I, this is the photo I used on the cover of the most recent snow trail. This was the top Canadian who finished second, and the top American finished third. What year again? 1996. At that time, they they felt that they had a chance to get women ski jumping into the United <laughs> Olympics in '98, but, but they didn't. And it, as it turned out, it was a very long. Very contentious process before before they finally got jumping in. So she, and as I said, that was only one event. Uh, they're not in Nordic combined yet. Is that in Rumford? You said yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes, Black, Black Mountain. And I'm going to I'm going to exit with a very very quick run through on some of the women who are making a, a major impact on on the sport of skiing and snowboarding today. Uh, these are alphabetical, in case anyone wants to know, since many of them are in the room. Lee Breidenbach, uh, for her long, long, and illustrious career in education and the ski industry, the sport of skiing, retail sales, most recently, Running the ski museums, uh, fashion shows. Mm -hmm. oh, cool. <laughs> Amy Boulanger, who's the uh, director of the ski school at Mount Abram. I think she's the only put uh, ski patrol director. I think she's the only female patrol director in, in Maine. If I'm wrong, I want to hear about it <laughs> because I want to get. I want the other one too. <laughs> Lee Dassler, who runs the Western Foothills Land Trust and it's Roberts Farm Preserve. Oh, really? Lee has been um, 
Well, he's been the executive director of the Washington Fort Hills Land Trust for about 20 years. And she not only acquired Robert's farm, she built a network of trails. She built the, um, the warming hut, pictured in the back of her. And she's got a great school program going. They host the Oxford Hills race teams. Where is this? This is in Norway. Yeah, in Norway. Yeah, it's, um, it's a place. It's, uh, it's, it's, yeah. you, know the, you know the picnic area right along Route, Pen uh, Route 118, Penasawasi? It's up on top of that hill. Oh, no. Behind. It's perpendicular to Penasawasi. Oh, Wendy Gray. Yay! Long. A long and distinguished career in the ski business, in the sport of skiing. Her most recent um, high office is president of the Ski Museum of Maine. Well, we have, this is, uh, we've got Dave, Dave Irons is here too. Chrissy Hamill, who, uh, she and her husband run the Maine Mountain Series, which is the grassroots competition for free skiing and uh, snowboarding. Megan Roberts, general manager. And, and again, the general, general manager Titkin is simply the latest in a long, long, long chain of, uh, of, of, of skiing history. We've got a great picture, I'm not showing it here. Yeah. Megan's first day on skis. She's six years old. She's out with, with her dad and, and absolutely beaming. And three of her sisters. At Tipton. Kate Punderson, who's the head of school at Carabasset Valley Academy. She wanted very much to be here tonight, but couldn't, couldn't get away. Uh -huh. So that's the end of the program. As far as I'm concerned, I want to emphasize that um, we're still lucky to approve it. And I'll just leave this slide up for a while. This is my contact info. Obviously, you can talk to me. Wendy is going to come out and uh, tell us what, what's happening from now on. Just, uh, Scott, I know you have lots of degrees, but R comes after P. Everybody <laughs> 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 notice. Did I insert some in the wrong spot? Yeah. Henderson <laughs> <laughs> comes before Megan Roberts. <laughs> 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 Otherwise, impeccable show. <laughs> While we set up for the panel, um, why doesn't everyone take a break? Five, ten minutes, stretch your legs. There's still some wonderful cookies out there. Um, wine, coffee, tea, whatever. And before you go, um, for all of you who registered, we're going to have a door prize drawing. Oh, for a frame the poster of the Sister Scotta, framed by Dave Irons. Make sure everybody, Dave, we have an, uh, your column still in the Lewiston paper tomorrow? Two more weeks. Two more weeks. Okay. So, here you go, Randy. Number is 27. Now she has to look it up. Um, Elaine Gochi from Hanover? Please. Okay. 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 Okay.
share some of their experiences as women who are prominent primarily as athletes and as the movers and shakers of, of today's ski world and snowboard world. And uh, Wendy, Wendy correctly pointed out that I'm not much good at alphabetizing, so, I, so I'm just going to introduce them uh, in order, left to right. We've got Lee Breidenbach, who uh, has been a director of the University of Maine Ski Industries program for many years. She has a long background in retail, uh, skiing, especially apparel and fashions. She's been the director of the uh, Ski Museum's fundraising fashion show. And most recently, uh, at least most prominently in, in Bethel, she was the general manager of the uh, new Sportoma shop from the day it opened up until about a year ago. Um, next, uh, we have Nikki Pilavakis, who is the first international snowboard cross champion. And she currently teaches snowboard cross and snowboarding in general at uh, Carabasa Valley Academy. We have um, Leslie Miller, um, Leslie Miller Morald. Not yeah. Oh, oh. Still yeah. <laughs> Les Leslie was uh, and pictured in 1972 as uh, a, a teenager in high school. She was one of that, those classic pictures on cross country skis. And uh, she's been involved in, in skiing for a long, long time. She came out of the, the Rumford Chisholm community and is still active. <coughs> Megan Roberts is the general manager of uh, Titcomb Ski Slope in West Farmington. It's a mountain now. It's a mountain. You got the yeah. yeah. It's not a slope anymore. Yes. Megan. We'll take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> it was a slope when I left to go to college. Came back years later, it became a mountain. <laughs> well, well so, someday when we're talking dirt about the ski industry, I'll tell you how Josh Burns added a 150 feet to Mount Abram. <laughs> um, but that's not that's another subject for another day. And finally, we have on the far right Barbara Schneider, who is the director of uh, executive director of Maine. Adaptive Sports and Recreation, um, formerly Maine Handicap Skiing. Barbara's been involved in the ski world for a long, long time, uh, including a uh, long time at, at the Sunday River Ski School. Hey, Barbara! <laughs> so, um, one, one, of the, one, of the one of the obvious questions is when we decided to do this women's program, is well, how is the women's ski experience, either the sport, the, the competitive aspects of the sport, or the business aspect, how is it different? And let's start with a basic question. Have you encountered any obstacles in your career because you're a woman? Alternatively, have you found any advantages that you've been able to take advantage of? So I'm just gonna, do, does somebody want to raise their hand and say, I'll, I'll start? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I would say that the obstacles probably outnumber the advantages because, I, to be honest, uh, there weren't a whole lot of advantages of, of being a woman. And like when I was in college, and there was never, there was always an athlete of the week at, at Plymouth State. And it had never ever been a woman athlete of the, of the week, um, but but <laughs> my friends got together and somehow I became the first woman athlete of the week after a yeah. ski race. So that was certainly a door that opened, um, but it wasn't anything to do with me other than I skied fast. But it was the women around that said, "We got to do this." Um, the, the disadvantages. I mean, I must say, when I was uh, the manager of Tickham the first time. And it was kind of a good old boys club there on the board. And it was very, very difficult for them to have the first woman manager who they realized actually kind of knew a little bit about what she was doing, although they had been there for many years before I was. So so it wasn't easy. 
I mean, some of them really tried to, to make it very difficult and make me in a bad position so that I would, I would kind of mess up, but persevered and kept on going. I, I had the opposite experience. Um, I moved to Bethel when I was not quite 20 years old, um, and I didn't know that German women didn't dominate the ski industry. Um, my mom was a ski coach, one of the first women PSIA certified, and I grew up in a very German-Austrian community in Ohio, and I moved to Maine, and there were two women on ski school. One was Cindy um, Kaylee, I never get a married name, but she's a Hebrew, you get my drift, and one other person, and so it, I didn't know that. Um, and my mom was the Olympic athlete in our family, so for me, I didn't know there were obstacles. Um, there have been certainly some along the way. Um, my friend Dolores and I were talking the other day. I think it's a little regional. I found, um, at least in my experience in Maine, um, I found most of the men that I've been involved with were really high quality people. Tom Reynolds, Ron Bonavy, um, uh, Bob Harkins. They were just Jones and Defying women who could um, haul 50 pound salt bags. Um, and so I qualified. But, but I think there's a bit of an old boy network that we're all kind of aware of. Um, so my mom taught me to walk into the room of old boys and don't bark, but just pick the biggest guy and bite him. <laughs> and, and, you know, see, see, see what happens. Um, the other thing I like about the industry, and maybe Nikki can really say to this, is if you can lay it down, they want to work with you. So I, that's the part that, that, that I love. But I will be honest, I... I tend to ignore men who put up obstacles. Um, but, but for me, it's, 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 been, it's been positive. It's been positive. No, I would agree with that. Um, snowboarding is so new, um, and uh, women are a big part of it because it, you know, we came later in time. Um, but I never really experienced any obstacles because companies were looking for women, and um, there wasn't a lot in the Northeast that snowboarded. I think I was one of the first at Sugarloaf. In fact, it was actually Saddleback where I started to snowboard. Um, I also went to Plymouth State, and I came home for break, and I was working on the chairlift, and I was sitting at the top of the chair, and I saw a snowboarder. I never saw a snowboard in my life. I didn't know what it was, and I I got out of my chair and I looked and I followed him down the mountain and then he disappeared and I was like, wow. And I didn't ski at that time. I was in, you know, junior in college and I had never skied. My wow. parents had moved to Rangeley from Standish and I thought, well, what am I going to do here? And I wasn't going to buy a sled, so, uh, so I eventually learned to ski and I really was not good at it. It scared me. And then when I saw the snowboarding, I thought, this, this is cool. Yeah. And um, I taught myself that winter, and I just fell in love with it and moved to Sugarloaf and started teaching. And then I ended up at CBA, where I really had no experience. I mean, it was just riding was my experience, and I thought I need to, to learn more. So got in the truck, I went out west, I threw myself in a race, and um, it, was a, it was a Vans Triple Crown. And they had four different events for snowboarders. And every event, I placed very high. And I thought, here's my calling. But really, I just wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to be a good coach. And I thought, if I did this, then I could experience and be able to teach through experience and not just through what I read or saw on TV. And that's how it started. And I traveled the world uh, for many years. And companies just really wanted women. And being in the East, I mean, there was really not a lot of East Coast snowboarding um, or women. And they kind of just threw stuff at me. Could you wear this? Will you promote this? Will you drink this? And so for me, it was... Uh, <laughs> um, I, uh, so I, I was very blessed. And um, I tried to keep it kind of main-based. I, I, um, 
I really just wanted to wear L.O. Bean clothing, and I really um, just wanted to drink L.O. Bean, uh, not L.O. Bean, but a Dual of <coughs> the juice company. From, it was Fresh Samantha back then. Um, and I just tried to kind of keep it in me, which was a mistake I look at now, but it's what I wanted. I wanted to promote Maine and the East Coast and um, so, but everybody was willing and it was, it was really a great experience. Mm. And I learned a lot about coaching and teaching on, on the way. Well, it wasn't so easy <laughs> uh, back in the 70s, actually in the 60s. Um, particularly in the Nordic world because it was dominated by men, but the, by boys. Because I was just a girl at that point too. And But what was expected in the Rumford area was that we were all part of that community. And when people were sent to the Junior Nationals, everybody raised money. So you didn't have to come up with several hundreds or thousands of dollars now. The town, through tag days and bake sales and all those mothers making oyster stews or whatever. I don't think we had oyster stew in Rufford, though. <laughs> they didn't eat pie. <laughs> but that's how they were sent, and we were part of that machine. I mean, as a little kid, um, I had to break the trail out back. Every fresh snowstorm we had, we went out back, and you, we had snowshoes, and we didn't have a snowmobile. Um, we had to track it in. And I really thought I was invited because it was Sisters of Scad. I didn't know what Scad was. I thought it was Sisters of Famous People. My <laughs> brothers were the famous people. I wasn't. <laughs> so as I grew up, I wanted to be like them. Um, and I had been skiing forever and a day in their stuff. So we started to race, but we raced against the boys. And in the sixth and seventh grade, it was just not a cool thing to be a boy. Like you're coming into adolescence. Um, I mean, we, we also went off the jumps, and when we went off the jumps and were caught, we were told two things. Number one, you pack for the day, and number two, you're not going to be able to have babies. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> Eric Rodgers, that was his... <laughs> Eric Roger told me I couldn't have a baby. Diane Fournier said, I don't care, I don't want them anyhow. <laughs> and so she kept doing it. Um, the rest of us, it was just a small kernel of girls. It was Susie Allen, Kathy Kersey, and Lizzie Chenard. And we had these foolish outfits that Glenna Allen made us to, so we could retain our femininity. Yes. And they were like blue with red flowers, and then we had this orange outfit that was a knicker thing. And they were made out of cotton. They were freezing. But we wore them religiously so that we would, you know, save our badge for our girlness out on the trails. When we began to beat the boys, um, that's when it kind of, they finally started to make a level for us. Um, but we didn't get leveled with our age group. We got leveled as women. So when you raced, I raced against Sarah Mae Berman, who was probably, I don't know, she had three kids. She was old to me. <laughs> um, I mean, they were all old, older women. Margaret Rockwell, I mean, these women were tough. Um, and that's how we raced. So obstacles, yeah, there were quite a few. Um, but being part of that, Chisholm Ski Club. I mean, Chummy Broomhall. Who could wish for a better coach for your first coach? Nobody. I mean, he was phenomenal. I mean, and we had this whole core of men. You now, the women were doing all the time and all the background stuff. My mom never skied, hated it. She was my high school ski coach. That was <laughs> odd. But that's what, you know, they did. They did whatever had to be done. And the men um, converted this waxing trailer thing, so that they did all our skis. I mean, they came out of the mill sometimes at 7 in the morning after the 11 to 7 shift, and they'd wax and get us ready all day long. I mean, the commitment for the community was phenomenal. And the pride they had in being kind of the first women in Maine that were starting to ski in us, um, I think, inspired us. I mean, that was... I wanted to go where my brothers had gone. I wanted to get on an airplane. I'd never been on one. Um, I wanted to go to the Olympics. And then I decided I wanted to do drama my senior year. My father died. Because <laughs> I quit skiing for a year. Um, yes, the opportunity was there, though. Um, but there were many obstacles. And when, we went, when I went to Orinoco, 
We got the Give Me Down sweaters from the boys team. They were like cardboard, you could barely get your arms down. I'm not sure if they'd been washed or what had happened. Um, we had a very limited budget. The you know, boys had a little bit more. I'm not saying, I mean, Brett did a great job. Um, but, but we made our sandwiches, bologna and cheese, remember it to the day, and those big bags, white bread. That's what we had for food when we went on our ski races. I mean, if we were district champions, New England district champs. Yay. Didn't matter. <laughs> it didn't matter. No extra money. My father wrote letters, um, but it was that was back in the day when there weren't a lot of women's sports. So those of you in the crowd that was here are starting to gray as well. Uh, you know, in the winter time, you either cheered or you didn't. I mean, you could play basketball, but that was not my thing. So I was grateful I had something that I could uh, get better at. So thanks. So even though I've been a lifelong skier, I'm fairly new to the profession and the industry. Um, and compared to my previous profession, I was a <laughs> trial lawyer. Skiing is really women friendly. Um, <laughs> I actually did the trademark work for Fresh Samantha when I was an attorney. So that was kind of interesting. But I came to Sunday River after having coached at Lost Valley for a while. And I found amazing support within the women the, the skilled women in the ski school at Sunday River. Um, and there were, you know, I used to count and say, boy, there are a lot of level three highly certified women instructors here. And I felt really, really lucky to have had so many great coaches and trainers and mentors. So it, it really is, by the time, you know, it was, you know, the late 90s, early 2000s, a, a very different world. The one thing I will say, though, is there is this sense and an expectation that women are going to be better coaches of young kids and better instructors for young children. And, and that may or may not be true. It's, it's actually what I'd like to do best because I think, and, and I'm a, in addition to running Maine Adaptive, I'm a weekend GACP coach and I've got the youngest athletes. And for me, it's particularly great to give young girls this great introduction to skiing. So among the, the and, and, and it's important to show them really fast skiing, really good skiing, really high level skiing, real good fearlessness. So, I mean, I think we're at this point in this industry where, where all the, the, a lot of those barriers have been broken. Um, and, and, it, and you see it all the way up from the kind of young, girls who are racing in large numbers at GACP and I'm sure at SCVA as well, all the way up to the World Cup, right? Who, who, do, who do, do most young American racers like to watch most? Michaela Schifrin. So, I mean, she's probably the racer whose name rolls off most kids' tongues right now. So, I'm kind of, even though I have gray hair, I'm more at the end of the spectrum. So, thank you, all of you. <laughs> it's Ash. <laughs> no, mine's, mine's really great. <laughs> Would you like us to keep talking on the same subject, or do you want us to? Yeah, you're doing a really great job. Um, I, I will. Um, part of my thinking when I was helping to put this program together is. Um, the last, I, I attend the uh, International Ski History Association annual conference the last few years. I've become a pretty good friend of uh, Susie Chaffee, who is probably the, the most influential woman in terms of moving the dial and getting women's uh, winter sports accepted. And she described feeling very much the playing the second fiddle, the, the hand-me-downs, her days in high school skiing, but especially when she went to the University of Denver, um, and continuing up through the 1968 Olympics, uh, when she, when, when, the, when the girls team didn't have a, um, a coach, they didn't have anybody to do the boxing or, or run the course. Um, in advance to check out what wax combination is on. And you know, the, the whole US, she, she was the number one 
skier on the U.S. team, and the whole team did very poorly at Grenoble. Um, mostly because they got they made a, a guess at the wax and it was dead wrong. I'd like to kind of detail some of the the, the second the second class. Uh, you know, you've already mentioned yeah. a couple of things. We have sweaters, but yeah, I'd be happy to. Well, I mean, I had all girls in my family. I have four sisters, um, but I still got the hand me downs. I was the middle girl. Um, but one thing that that to me was almost more advanced in that when I did go to Plymouth, we were Division One. We were racing Division One, and our coach fought for us to race Division One, which was absolutely marvelous because we did get the recognition. We did get the dinners beforehand, um, steak dinners with, with the men and women together. I'm not trying to ask your age, but what year was that? Um, <laughs> that was 75 through 78. So I'm 60. <laughs> Just a spring chicken. Just a spring chicken. Um, but when Barbara mentions how, how among the athletes the, there are so many women, but I am um, the vice president of Ski Main Association, and I manage Chicka Mountain, and I am still the only woman in the board meetings. You know, all these years I'm often the only female there. And uh, certainly everyone knows me and accepts me by now, but still it's sometimes like, well, where, where's everybody else? <laughs> well, yeah, where are the women? And, and so now this is my, my second round, you might say, of Titcom, and the board totally accepts me, and um, it is a lot easier. They know my skills, um, and I really truly feel like a mentor to the young kids, and a lot of the girls... Um, and the moms are so glad that I'm the manager because they're like, see, a woman can do it. Mm -hmm. And so I do have hope that sometime there'll be some other women in, uh, in, in the ski main. You know, we, we have actually, but uh, yes? I just wanted to point out, I mean, Leslie alluded to it, but Title IX went through in 1973. Yeah. So, so, so nothing was really happening. You know, the schools weren't or so even, you know, guilt tripped into doing anything for girls. I mean, we really didn't have any options except the ski team. You know, there really wasn't organized basketball in junior high school. So, you know, for the younger folks here, just, you know. Yep. Well, well, for me, I was pre-Title IX. Um, so I ran 440 leg on the men's team. And then after my brother, who went on to be an Olympic athlete, I because he made me fetch his discus. Um, I threw on the men's team, and yes, I did whoop my boyfriend. Um, no problem. That's a competition. Um, but I think, I think, I think about um, w women in the industry. Um, for years, I was the, um, so my real background is coaching and teaching. Fashion came later, because that pays the bills. Um, but um, I was always the only woman um, for any PSIA event, um, level, you know, I did my level three at Sugarloaf. I'm a hidden Sugarloaf fan, which I have to be careful of in these <laughs> neck of the woods. But um, as, director, as director of the Ski Industry Program at UMF and being part of that program for 27 years, the majority of my students were men, mm -hmm. and they were 18 years old. And my job was to help them be successful enough so they could really make a real difference and a living in this industry. And the first year I came came there, which was 1990, and I took over the position for doctor. Yes, I'm a very young 59. Um, I, I took over for Dr. Roche, and I had a student come up to me, a Rumford boy. And I, I, I lived outside of Rumford for years, so I'm... <laughs> I bow, I bow, I bow at the feet of, of Black Mountain, what they've done. But he walked right up to me and he said, I have absolutely nothing to learn from a woman. And my response to him was, it's going to be a really hard year for you because I'm half the act. So I was lucky in that I got to do the opposite. If you really wanted to work in this industry and... If you got through four, year, four years of UMF with myself and Tom Reynolds, they wanted you because they knew you knew, you knew a lot. Um, being on time, disciplined. So I turned it around 
to say, I'm here to help you be better husbands, better boyfriends, better men, and better at what you do. And it was, it was magical. And after that first year, I never had a single male student who looked at me as anything other than their lead professor. Um, to the point that I was truly sexless. And I guess that would be the other, the end of it, as a, as a woman in this industry. You, you know, one of the things my mom said is, the guys can get drunk, you cannot. Um, if you want to be Betty Bimbo, you go ahead and do it, but you will never work in this industry. You, you, so the, the level of expectations was a little bit different. It fit my personality fine, so there's no problem there. But, <laughs> But, but watching, watching the male students figure out how to navigate with half of where they wanted to get was a woman was, I think, I think you know, really positive. But I, I do wish there were more women and more women of my age um, at some of these places of authority. But what the hell, you know? <laughs> Just... Just, and the girls will the, the young girls will catch up. Barbara makes a good point about you know being a real role model for these six years old and twelve year olds, and you know so part of our responsibility now is to model for the young girls. Just like my mother, my mother was the Olympic athlete in our family, not not the guy. Well, the guys came later, but at least with my dad. So it's it's our job to model for them. You know, throw your shoulders back, take up space, and do it. I will add that my first year at Sugarloaf was 1990, and I was in the locker room with a lot of those UMF guys. And the word in the word in the locker room was that Lee was the bomb. <laughs> she was the bomb. No, no. <laughs> no, I um. So the coaching part for me, and um, trying to try to kind of get the girls together in the snowboard industry is is really what I love to do. I love to show them that you can do it. You're a girl. You're just as strong. You're just as fast. And um, a lot of the girls that went through CVA that are now mothers, a lot of those girls that I had, <coughs> and we had a lot of boys. They would always be the last one. They would always be in back of the boys. But I tell you, by the end of their careers at CBA, they all went on to nationals. They all did really well. Um, and they were fast snowboarders. And um, they're beautiful mothers. And uh, I'm just proud to say that I was part of that. Um, and I'm continuing to do that with my girls. And any girl that comes to me, I, I'm right behind them. And, um, so that was really my focus, but I just happened to be a fast snowboarder at the time and, and uh, just uh, training the years that I trained with the ski school and then the CBA um, at Sugarloaf, just riding that sort of terrain all the time really, really made a difference and going out west and racing with those girls and then going to Europe and they were more of my caliber because they were used to racing on hard conditions and they were serious about it. Um, whereas the Western girls were kind of, they just, they, yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, they were just having fun, wearing baggy clothes, and, um, and I was a little bit more serious because I was older, too. I was always the oldest female um, at races, and uh, they, they called me the grandma. Oh. So, uh, yeah. in, in, the, in the X Games, that's how I was referred to as the grandmother of so, uh, at 30. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 um, I really have enjoyed being a part of young girls and, and helping them to recognize that they are and can be as strong as uh, a male snowboarder. And, um, and because there are so few women in this industry that are at our level, um, the sky's the limit. What do you guys think about that? Why aren't there more women? You know, I was going to speak to, well, I was one of the first women that got my PSIA in Nordic. Um, and number one, there weren't a lot of Nordic 
instructor something yeah, right. <laughs> in the late 70s. And so I was one of the only women in the class. Um, but I know that when I started, and I, I became part of the ski school at the Touring Center at Carabas, and I'd have I'd have people raise their eyebrows, you know, like, is there another instructor, like a guy? <laughs> you know? Oh, she's it? You know? And for the high school boys, I let, you know, I was a coach. And I, I liked to do the one-on-one um, -on -one coaching. Um, but boy, I had a hard time breaking in. You know, the, that whole believability that you could do it. Um, I, and likewise, we started that, we had a ski skate program that had begun before we moved there. But just being out in the trails with all the girls and boys, letting those girls believe that it didn't matter where you were, just do it. Just get out there and do it, and you're going to find your dream. You're going to find your one thing you're probably better at than somebody else. And even if you don't, it'll be a lifelong sport. Um, so I, I really, I think it's been a hard industry for women to get into. Um, I didn't have, it was very hard in that era, in the early late 70s, early 80s at Sugarloaf, there were not a lot of women except teaching the little kids mm -hmm. <laughs> at Sugarloaf. Oh. How do we get the media to change about how they treat women in skiing? It's better in snowboarding, I think. I do too. But in skiing, like if you go to watch a ski movie, it's all guys. And there's the token female who's pretty, who shows up somewhere in the middle of the end, and you see one run of her, and then that's it, and then she's gone for the rest of the film. Or if you open a magazine and you look at it, <coughs> guys are like ripping things, and they're hawking clips, and they're doing things, and there's the woman in her pretty outfit, you know, basically. And so it's hard as a mother to see good modeling out there in the media. So how do we do? But I, I admit, snowboarding seems to have done better in that. You see a lot more women represented as hardcore, like going for it snowboarding and do skiing. I'm wondering why there's that. I think it's when it's a new sport, too, yeah, there's yeah. opportunities for women to show yeah, it. Yeah. When I was coming up in Nordic, it was an opportunity. Yeah. And I'm an opportunist. I wasn't great at basketball. I wasn't great at this. I wasn't great at that. There weren't a lot of women. You could win. You know? And I think the media part was there in Rumford for us. I mean, I got more media attention than I'm sure I deserved, you know, because it was, it was what the town did. You know? I'm not sure I have a lot to add on the media component. Um, but I do think it is interesting. One of the jobs that I've had in the industry was um, kind of running a department of the kids ski school at Sunday River. And Lee's point about, you know, the young instructors in a ski school and, you know, that I always thought that that was really important um, thing that I could do was to kind of teach some of these young women in this very free, fun-loving environment, you know, how important their own sense of dignity was, how important it was to really not, you know, perform their jobs well. And, and for me, one of the most fun things that I still have is all these young women who, were, they, were, they were maybe in high school at Gould, or they were at Farmington as students, and they're now out there in the industry. And that's really fun to see where they're going and where they are. They tend to leave the East, I found. The real right? money's west of the right. I mean, most of the people that, the really, the, the stellar ones that I've worked with and have wanted to stay in this industry go out west. And they're, you know, running comps and events departments out there. They're doing marketing and communications. So that's really fun. And it's, again, this whole idea that we can create a network within the industry that, that I see that as super, super important. So I, I didn't spend a lot of time trying to change the attitudes of some of the young kids who, the, male, the young men who kind of, you know, thought they were cooler, thought they were better, thought they were stronger. Um, and I, I do remember that sometimes the proof is out there on the hill. That, that job where I was managing, I was inside a lot, and every once in a while I'd go out, and boy, I'd make it a point to out-ski those young men, <laughs> as, and I could do it. Um, and that's what you have to do a little bit. So it is a sport, it is a place where performance matters, and, you know, I think 
it's an interesting sport, um, industry because, I mean, I certainly was not a world-class athlete or even a state-class athlete or, and didn't, because of geographic reasons, get to be a ski racer when I was a kid. But it's still a, 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 an industry where performance athletically counts for a lot. And those of us who tend to be in places where we're running things and managing things have that athletic part behind us to back us up. I, I, I am known to lure old men up on the lift and then trash them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so I don't get to know that much either. When I do, everyone's like, well, she can ski. I mean, right now, she can ski. It's always a shock. That's always... We got a question. question? It's not really a question. It's more of a comment. I work in the ski industry, and I'm 27. Um, I think... A large part of why you're not seeing men in the industry is that it's just a time continuum. We're seated in now, but we're young. We're working yeah. our way up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would like to work in this industry forever, but right. I'm not. I'm not a CEO yet. <laughs> yes. I think that's a good point. You know, when I first went out west, she talks about there are more women out west. But when I first, right after college, I went right to the Rockies, and um, I was a, a race coach for the mm -hmm. high school age kids. But again, I was the only woman coach mm -hmm. in racing that age group. And um, and, it, and it, I don't know if they ever really, I mean, they still haven't really caught up. But I think that's a very good point that there is going to be, we just aren't going to quite see it. Or maybe when we're in our rocking chairs, we'll see it. But. <laughs> but what I would say to you is the industry is looking for women who really want to do this. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, at you know, UMF, I was there 27 years. And three quarters of my students were always men, but the the women that came in once you made it through my intro class, which was like one out of three, let's be real. But the, the women, the women who made it, um, are all 100% still in the industry. Um, you know, Untracked.com, Amada, Rosignol, Vocal, Marker, all of them. The, the industry is looking for you. You just can't hide, and you and 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 you. And the other thing I would say, in my experience is, don't play the gender card either way. Just lay it down. This is what you are. This is what you you have. Um, and and but they're looking for women, particularly on the technical side. I was a tech rep for years. They were begging for women. Who could, who could, who could tech side. What's yeah, interesting I, is that I don't really notice the gender <coughs> card, which I think is a testament to your good work because it, it's never really come up. Yeah. Right, yeah. and I certainly don't. I think that was a great, great phrase that Lee had. You know, we become sexless, sexless, and really, I just, I just ignore everything around me and just do what I do, mm -hmm. and you know, see what happens. Um, and so I, I do think that that's a good point. It's interesting though, my daughter is 11, and she has never been in a group of ski, a ski group where she has girls that can ski as well. And she's always a boy, and she's always had male instructors and coaches, and she's never had that. Put them with ours. So I just, you know, I looked at pictures of her Saddleback ski group, there were like 12 of them, and she was the one girl. You know, it's like for her. Yeah. So the young ones <laughs> well, need to take leadership her. roles. Jump yeah, out and take leadership so roles. So, so I've got a bumper yeah. sticker for her. I, for, for, I, I'm a blocky, aggressive skier. Let's just leave it at that. And a number of people say, oh, you ski like a man. A man. And my response was, do I look like one? <laughs> so I have a great bumper sticker that says, you wish you could ski like a woman. <laughs> You know, not you ski like a girl, you ski like a woman, but it's to change that image of what we think women ski, ride, and let's not forget the park, the pipe, what's going on with freestyle in, in the ski world. You, you watch what some of these women are laying down, and it's, it's phenomenal. And you, you think about the media, it's, it's prevalent. Um, one of the assignments I used to have in the intro classes, I'd give them all the journals, and I would say, tell me, because they're 18 years old. So what they know about the world is the 18-year-old male brain. <laughs> 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 
but, but, but I, would, I would say to them, what do these, what do these magazines say in the, in the online? And they were right every time. And then they would look and go, but that's not the world I know. So the, the media portrays we want to sell certain things. It doesn't have to do with the reality of what's happening out there. I just wanted to speak to Karen's um, point about the media. Those of us in Bethel, some of us have been to, Kate Goldberg has, has had uh, films showing how abysmal the media is to women, also to boys too. But we all, as, as, as human beings in this society, need to point out the things that are wrong. I have sons. My goal was to make sure they saw things that were wrong. I had a son come home going, how come they wear these t-shirts that say, girls rule? It was Leslie Critchko, uh, Bancroft Critchko, by the way, <laughs> beating him in a race and he could see girls rule. And he resented those things. And I had to remind him of the centuries of, of misuse, you know, sexism and uh, misuse of women. And uh, so that media doesn't, and Kate Goldberg had this, this uh, film a few years later and it wasn't improving. And so when we see these horrible, or magazine that's all men ripping it up, we have to speak to it whenever we can. My daughter-in-law runs a ski, um, a ski program in um, Idaho, and they were voting on names for groups, and the hot <coughs> shit group was all boys. And she said to the male coach, uh, do you notice anything wrong with this? She had to get in his face. And it's not just the women getting in men's faces, it's all human beings getting it right, and we are improving, but we all have to keep working at it. In the media, yeah. you know, in our homes, talk about it. Yeah. Do we have any other questions from the audience? I, I have one final question that I'd like to pose to the, to the panel, and this comes from an interview I had with uh, Chrissy Hamill who runs the Maine Mountain Series. I, I spent some time with her up on the slopes of Shawnee Peak watching a, a slope style competition. And after maybe a couple, couple of rounds, I pointed out to Chris, you know, the guys, well, guys, you know, seven-year-old boys, outnumber the seven-year-old girls by about two or three to one. And she said, yeah, that is true. So I asked her, how, how is it that in this day and age when there are no barriers in your particular program, yet we are still seeing a, a vast uh, number of um, more boys than the girls? But we're talking about the, the extreme slope style, you know, um, terrain parks, uh, rails, and eventually it will be inverts and, and that sort of, sort of thing. And I'm especially ask uh, Nikki, because you're the, mm -hmm. you're, you're closest to yeah. the competition. Yeah, no, I, um, I don't know why that is. I, I really don't. I, I mean, there are plenty of girl snowboarders out there, but the, com <coughs> the competitive side, I don't, I don't know. They just really? want to just ride for fun or just for recreation. Um, it was always that way at SCBA too. It was always a few girls and a lot of boys. So I don't know. Even even at my races, there were hundreds of guys and maybe forty girls. And this is worldwide. So I don't know. Anybody else care to comment? I don't have any brilliance on it at all, but I did notice that one of our um, historic races, our Dartmouth race, which is for kids age 12 and under, this year actually had about the same number of girls and boys. Yay. Yeah, so I was glad to see that. I, I think to, to Megan's point, because um, I was really fortunate to, um, the thing I'm, out of everything I'm most proud about is the after school program we ran at Tickham for 10 years. Um, K through three, because Tickham couldn't do, do kindergarten kids. And one of the things that I noticed is the more, and, and this was not a drop-off parent program. Parents were involved. We saw them every day, talked to them. 
the more involved the parents are, and I always said the mom is kind of the guardian, so thus I ended up in the ski industry. I was two, she dropped us at the hill, said, see at the end of the day, don't get hurt. Um, Mount Abrams like that, Tickums like that. I think um, the more parents are involved for the kids, the more you will see that even, even out. Um, so one of the pieces I'm looking forward to doing for the Ski Museum is the, the history of the unsung moms um, in, the, in, the, in the industry. So I, I, my answer is it's, it's, it's parents. It's, it's parents. We, we guide them. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful discussion, and uh, the audience is dismissed officially. You are, of course, welcome to come up and, and ask individual questions of myself, the panelists, or Wendy, or uh, Randy Bennett, or any of the other people running tonight's program. But thank you so much for coming. You've been a great audience, and it's been wonderful. Yeah.